from the hell that is Dunkirk. Back from the steel thrust of the German war machine comes the BEF. The evacuation of troops from the beaches at Dunkirk was rightly celebrated as a great moment in British history. This is the most magnificent sight of a generation. This is the army under its magnificent leaders. They have come back from a terrible and bitter battle, but still in their tired and half-closed eyes is mirrored the spirit and cause for which they fight. That has not gone. That can never be taken away from them. On the 4th of June, the day the last troops came home, Prime Minister Winston Churchill rallied the country with his most famous of speeches. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. What Churchill didn't say was that on that very same day, Tens of thousands of British troops were still in France, fighting for their lives. Everybody seems to think Dunkirk was the end of it. They never mentioned the 51st Island Division. After the rest of the British Army had gone home, the 51st Highland Division were ordered to fight on against the might of Adolf Hitler's war machine. Everything was chaotic. It was hellish. Never dreamed that that would come out bad as it did. Now, almost 80 years later, the last survivors of that division tell their extraordinary story for the first time. And using recently declassified secret documents, the full details of their fight for survival can now be revealed. It's the story of a desperate battle in the face of overwhelming odds. The doomed rescue mission launched to save them. And when all seemed lost, their remarkable, courageous last stand. We saw the tanks coming. Then we knew we were in for a bit of a, a real face in. This is the untold story of what happened after Dunkirk. I think of the forgotten men who never made it home. In January 1940, the 20,000 men of the 51st Highland Division had arrived in France. They were there as part of the British Expeditionary Force, or BEF. Half a million British soldiers sent across the Channel to help the French army defend against a possible German invasion. Well, we were going to serve our country. As young men at that age, you're full of brag. Full of wind, if you like. Our feeling was that it'd be short. We'll show them when we get there, and that would have been the end of it. We said it'd be over by Christmas. <laughs> Didn't say which year, though. In April, the 51st Division were separated from the rest of the BEF. They were put under the command of the French Army and sent to help defend the Maginot Line. The Maginot Line is, is one of the strongest defensive lines the world has ever known. I mean, it's absolutely formidable. It covers the entire French and German border. So uh, it's up 150 main forts. It is an incredible feat of engineering, and there is absolutely no way on earth any German army is going to break through it. The 51st was stationed by the Hackenberg Fortress, the largest in the whole line, and a showpiece of French fortification. 1,000 troops lived underground, manning 15 combat blocks and 18 artillery guns, 10 of which were mounted on retractable electric turrets 
capable of firing through 360 degrees. Such is the mighty frontier of modern France, a frontier written in steel and concrete. Blocks were connected by 10 kilometers of tunnels through which trains ran carrying supplies and ammunition. Power for the railway comes from the central power station. Here are electric dynamos. Power for the kitchen, storing enough food to keep a quarter of a million men below the surface for a whole year. There were six kitchens, a bar, a cinema, and a wine cellar. The presence of Highlanders and other British troops at the front has made it possible for many... Apart from a few border skirmishes, life on the Maginot Line was quiet. It was just flat on the front line for weeks and weeks and weeks and nothing happened. We could see the Germans walking along their line and the British was walking along their line and nobody bothered or even talking to one another. Troops from opposing sides even socialized together. Some Germans were coming through the wood armed with bottles. That's, that's, well, that's strange. And the French troops, I said, oh no, it's their turn to come over tonight. We were there last weekend. Now imagine me in the Maginot Line, sitting on a mine in the Maginot Line. Now it's turned out nice again, the army life is fine. At night myself to sleep I sing, to my old tin hat I cling. I have to use it now for everything. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, it was a thrill being there, but never dreamed that that would come out bad as it did. On the 10th of May, Adolf Hitler ordered his forces to invade France, not attacking the Maginot Line but by driving straight through the Ardennes forest. The French leadership doesn't believe the Germans are going to pass through the Ardennes because they think that any German attack will be motorized and that the windy, narrow roads, hills, forests and river system that is a feature of the Ardennes forest would make any kind of mobile armor thrust completely impossible. Over a million German troops and thousands of panzer tanks charged through the forest almost totally unopposed. The marginal line didn't really count for nothing. The Germans just walked past it. German forces cut a devastating swathe right through the centre of France, overwhelming Allied defences with the speed and strength of their combined attack. With a massive German force also invading through Belgium, the bulk of British forces were quickly encircled. And of course, the British get caught in this massive pocket in northern France, which just diminishes and diminishes and diminishes until there is no alternative but to retreat the vast bulk of them, evacuate them from Dunkirk. 338,000 British and French troops were evacuated but not a single soldier of the 51st was amongst them. We didn't even know about Dunkirk. When the British army was evacuated, we were left behind. The German thrust through the Ardennes had cut off the 51st from the rest of the BEF. And there were no plans to evacuate them. Yes, British and French troops have been evacuated from Dunkirk, but there was a whole nother fight that is just about to start taking place south of, of the River Somme, you know, for the southern half of France. And the only complete British division which is in that half of France is the 51st Highland Division. So it is utterly unthinkable that they should be taken out at this point. There's still a battle to be fought. They've got to play their part. Churchill said, we fight on to the last, last man, the last bullet. He says, we are going to fight to the last ditch. This was Churchill's idea. No more evacuations. You fight on. The 
day after the Dunkirk evacuation ended, the papers celebrated a miracle and the country rejoiced at having brought its army home. But the soldiers of the 51st Highland Division weren't among them. Never knew nothing about Dunkirk at no time. They were still in France. As the Germans invaded, the 51st were pulled back to the town of Abbeville. They were now on the front line, fighting alongside the French to try and stop Hitler's forces invading the rest of France. The next thing we knew, we were dragged back up to Abbeville, and that's the first really big battle we had. By the time we did get up into the Abbeville area, things were awful. There's nothing what wasn't burnt down or exploded in front of you nearly. Everything was chaotic. Abbeville was literally shattered. We're fighting at every back street. We were just going back from one street to another, and the Germans were still on it. And the whole place was a mess. The next thing we saw was a crowd of Frenchies running across in front of us, shouting La Boche. La Boche, that's when the tanks were coming. They just stormed off, and we were left holding it. I was pretty scared. You tell me anybody that wasn't. After a week of relentless fighting, the 51st's commanding officer, General Victor Fortune, had had enough. He says, I've been holding a ridiculous front since the 31st of May, in addition to having a troublesome battlefront, which is putting it mildly, in the middle of it. I'm only too ready to keep a sense of proportion, but I owe my soldiers some loyalty. And I quite candidly state, it is sheer murder to keep us on a 19-mile front 24 hours longer. Fortune's plea to withdraw fell on deaf ears. Churchill feared the French might surrender and was determined to reassure them. I sang my usual song. We would fight on whatever happened. It is vital that the French keep fighting. But it is also absolutely vital that the British are seen to support their ally. You're there to save the French and you fight until the last, and you're the last out. The 51st's mission was now clear. Fight on with the French and survive as long as possible. The French campaign is going to only end one way. It is not a question of if, it is a question of when the French capitulate. And from the British perspective, it is vital that the French capitulate as far down the line as is humanly possible. On the 6th of June, Abbeville fell to the Germans. The 51st and their allies from the French 9th Army were now being forced back from one defensive line to another suffering the full ferocity of the Nazi onslaught. Along the road, there was all civilians who had been machine gunned from the air. There was bodies, children, women, men. Loads of them. The Stokers, it was the bombs that dropped. They used to scream as it came down the bomb, and then explode. Their tanks, we thought, was battleships. They were attacking with the tanks and shells. The artillery it was getting worse and worse. We were losing men all the way. The Germans were on a very fast run, and once you start retreating, you keep going until you're pushed right out. Having lost or abandoned most of their heavy weaponry, the 51st were left facing the German army with little more than small arms. They were armed with every bit of equipment you can think of. They were using everything under the sun. The 
just had all rifles. We was very unarmed, very, very much indeed. The Germans were better equipped all round. A perfect illustration of just how outgunned the 51st were on the retreat from Abbeville is seen by comparing their main machine gun with what the Germans were using. This is the standard light machine gun for the British Army, and it became known as the Bren. This was the 51st section support weapon. If you had a Bren gun in your regiment, you're lucky. You're supposed to have several, but they were so short. It was developed during the 1930s. It operated from a 30-round box magazine, went on very quickly. That's it fitted. It fires the standard rifle round. It had a slow rate of fire of only 520 rounds per minute. It also had one major problem with this gun. It was very, very accurate, which is not really ideal for a machine gun. Accuracy is good, but what you want a machine gun to do is put a wide arc of fire out when you're firing bursts. And the idea of that is you keep as many heads down by putting down suppressive fire. If you hit the enemy, that's just an added bonus. German MG34 had a high rate of fire of 800 rounds per minute, so it outclassed the Bren gun for suppressive fire. We kept diving into the ditches and the canals to try to avoid the machine gunning. It also used 250 round belts. Very useful because you don't have to keep changing the magazine. We lost a good food by machine gunning. At the time when it was manufactured, it probably was the Rolls Royce of machine guns. By the 8th of June, as well as being outgunned, the 51st were now being outmaneuvered to the east by General Erwin Rommel. What Rommel manages to do with his 7th Panzer Division is break through and thrust southwards. And he actually does 60 miles in one day. I mean, it's this extraordinary speed. Still under orders to stay with the slower French forces, General Fortune and the 51st Highland Division were unable to move fast enough to outrun Rommel. On the 9th of June, Rommel's panzers reached the Normandy coast. Which means that the 51st Highland Division, as well as the French 31st Division, are now completely encircled. The Germans appeared to have the 51st at their mercy. However, one man refused to give up on them. Admiral William James, Commander-in-Chief of Naval Forces in Portsmouth. Portsmouth was a command area and controlled a large stretch of coast from New Haven all the way down to Dorset. And he was the naval officer in charge of that entire sector of the English Channel based in Portsmouth Harbour. When Admiral James learned of the plight of the 51st, without any official war office sanction, he began to organise a flotilla of boats to launch a rescue mission. Some of these were Dutch barges, transport vessels. Some of these had just returned from Dunkirk. And he also sent his flag lieutenant into the Hamble River, where he started gathering a number of private yachts ready to go over. But there's still no idea as to when this evacuation might take place. The plan was to evacuate the 51st from saint valery on cove On a coastline of steep cliffs, this small fishing port offered the only harbour and beaches where a mass evacuation could be attempted. By the 10th of June, Admiral James had gathered a flotilla numbering 207 boats, easily enough to accommodate what remained of the 51st. Boats would need time to get into saint Valery, embark troops and get out again. So, along with their French allies, the 51st created a defensive ring around the town. Private Don Smith was with the 4th Seaforth Highlanders to the east of saint Valery. Now aged 97, he still remembers where he was told to set up his machine gun. Here we are. That's it. Orders were, hold this line, 
right across these fields. We're talking three battalions at least, and then stretched across. What was left of us anyway? And we were looking for the enemy coming towards us. I was on the machine gun there, covering the field down that side and the road so that I could swing round with the gun. We've been on the move day after day. We just had to get there and line up, get the guns up ready. Because we hadn't, we, hadn't, we, hadn't, we hadn't time to dig in. All we had time to do, flatten ourselves out on the ground, get the guns set up, and that was it. The 51st were now surrounded. Their only hope was to hold out long enough to be saved by Admiral James's rescue flotilla. Sam Valerie would be their last stand. By the morning of the 11th of June, 1940, a flotilla of 207 boats was under fire off the coast of France. They were there to launch a Dunkirk-style rescue of the 51st Highland Division. But Admiral William James, the man who'd hatched the plan, became aware that any evacuation would have to wait. With the Luftwaffe overhead, and with enemy shore batteries being established along the cliffs on either side, he recommended that no evacuation should be attempted in the daylight hours. We saw ships well out in the distance at St. Valerie. You know, they'd come to try and get us away, but they couldn't. Well, the ships couldn't come into Lewis, because the Germans were shunned them. The German Stukas were firing on whatever ships were out there. Admiral James conferred with the senior officers of the 51st Highland Division and asked if they could hold out until nightfall, and they believed that they could. Eighteen-year-old Private Don Smith was part of the defensive perimeter set up around San Valery to try and hold out till nightfall. He was lying in a field, manning a Bren gun. You were apprehensive what, you, you know, what was going to happen to you and your mates. But we had to concentrate on what was doing. Alongside Don were two of his best mates, Bernard Finn and Edward Nobby Clark. At the end of 38 and beginning of 39, I took a photograph of my friends at Fort George, stood at the side of a German gun captured in the First World War. And these lads were my pals. Two went to school with me, and the others were local lads. And uh, we decided when war broke out, and we were going across before we went across to France, that if we all survived, we would try and meet up at the Cenotaph each year. Waiting for the German attack, Commanding Officer General Victor Fortune tried to raise spirits, telling his men salvation was at hand. Clearly, he's still full of fighting zeal and defiance and believes that the, the division can still be saved. He says, you know, the Navy will probably make an effort to take us off by boat. Perhaps tonight, men may have to walk five or six miles. The utmost discipline must prevail. So it's, come on, chaps, you know, just, just one last effort. You can do it. I, you, you haven't let me down yet. Admiral James's flotilla is waiting just off the shore. You can see that he absolutely believes that, you know, they will be rescued, they will be saved, and they will live to fight another day. What no one knew was that in attempting to evacuate them from San Valerie's beaches, Admiral James was disobeying the orders of his superiors. He received a message from the Admiralty saying that the War Office stated that there would be no evacuation off of the beaches, but James wasn't convinced. And so he said that he would keep his plan of assembling all available transports and small craft in the possible evacuation area. Ignoring the war office, James kept his flotilla off San Valery. He knew how desperate the 51st's position now was. The lads were tired, worn out. Ammunition was very sparse. Five rounds of ammo 
per man would we reduced it with because they hadn't got the ammunition there to give us. Holding out until nightfall was not going to be easy. Especially as this was the heaviest weapon they had left. This is the boys' anti-tank. It was the only anti-tank weapon that the 51st had. The boys' rifle is supposed to stop a tank, but they never penetrated the steel or what they were supposed to do. And it had a hell of a kick to it. You risk severe headaches, concussion, that kind of thing. It's quite an unpleasant weapon to fire. It wasn't a good weapon at all. It was no good at all. It was manufactured between wars. It came with a five round magazine. It fired a large caliber 0.55 round, an armor piercing projectile. And it's basically a big Lee Enfield rifle. Close the bolt, operate it, aim and fire. This piece of armor plating is 30 millimeters thick the same as the armor found on a Panzer III tank. So what damage can the boys' rifle inflict on it? The first round misses the plate, but goes straight through the thinner metal of the support frame, showing how it could be effective against lightly armored vehicles. The second round hits the armor plating square on, and it does little more than chip the paint. That's the frightening part. It's down to you to stop an armoured invasion, really. And if you can't stop it with this, it's time to get out of the way or run. Because once you've actually brought them to your attention that you're firing this at them, they'll bring everything they can to fire at you. By late afternoon on the 11th of June, the Germans still hadn't made their move. It would be dark in just six hours, and the evacuation flotilla could then move into San Valery. It was beginning to look like the 51st may be saved. But at 4 p.m., the Germans attacked. Three frontline divisions, made up of over 30,000 troops, around 400 tanks, 200 artillery guns, and almost 1,000 field guns, all supported from the air by the Luftwaffe. We saw the Germans coming across. Uh, first of all, it was the infantry seemed to be coming. And when we opened fire, they slowed down, they stopped them. But the next minute, we saw the tanks coming. They must have felt that they needed some heavy stuff to get into us. And I would say probably about 30 tanks spread across, coming across. Then we knew we were in for a bit of a, a real pasting. And then they started advancing again. We were firing for several minutes, it was going on, and then suddenly they opened up the big artillery. And we're still firing, and I took my hand off the machine gun to change the magazine. And as I did that, this shell burst over the top, and that was it, bang. My hand went back like that, it just felt like somebody kicked it. And bang on the head, and the next minute was out. Don had a finger blown off. He suffered bad shrapnel wounds to his head and back and was knocked unconscious. Lying alongside Don when the shell exploded were his best mates Bernard Finn and Edward Nobby Clark. I didn't know at the time, but they were killed outright and I was a fortunate one. They were either side of me, and they were killed outright. I was very fortunate. The man upstairs looked after me. Unconscious, Don was evacuated up to a makeshift first aid post on the cliffs above San Valery. First aid post was a mess. Blood's lying on the floor, someone stretches. And as soon as he went in, there aren't enough uh, morphine or anything like that to help the lads. And they just give that man a fag. I've never smoked in my life, but that was, <laughs> give that man 
Oh, fuck. By now, the Germans had broken the defensive ring. Some of the 51st made a desperate bid to reach the beach in hope of rescue. Some people attempted to escape. They were on the edge of the cliff. It was a 300-foot drop. They fixed their rifle belts together and lowered themselves down the cliff. Now, when they got about 20 feet from the bottom, that was as far as the belts went. So they had no option but to drop. Now, some dropped onto the sandy beach, which broke their fall, but others fell onto the rocks and were killed outright. By early evening, the Germans had control of the cliffs above St. Valery, and most of the 51st had been pushed back into the town itself. The rescue flotilla was ready offshore, but Admiral James still faced a frustrating four-hour wait for nightfall. I shall never easily forget that night. The last signals from the 51st Division were so tragic and bitter to read. Situation critical. When can we expect boats running short of ammunition? And I could do nothing. Back on shore, Rommel thought the game was up. Between 1800 and 1900, 6 p.m. and 7 p.m., a Frenchman arrives at Divisional HQ. He'd been captured and was sent in by the Germans to demand surrender by 2000. Otherwise, a fresh attack would be launched. He was sent back to say that we had no intention of surrendering. So Fortune's not surrendering because he knows there is this flotilla from Portsmouth hanging off the coastline. All they've got to do is wait for darkness. So it's just a question of hanging in there for a precious few hours. And then, with a bit of luck, the vast majority, if not all of them, can escape back to England. When Rommel learned that his surrender request had been rejected, he ordered San Valery to be pounded. They occupied the top of the cliffs there. We were shelled and bombed from the cliffs in the air. Terrible, that was. It was hellish. The bombs from the Stukas were dropping all around. The Germans had their massive tanks, and they were joining in the bombardments. And the thought was that that was the end of it. As night fell, San Valery was being pulverized by German shells. But now the flotilla could finally start to move in. If their luck held, the 51st might yet pull off an extraordinary escape. German bombardment of San Valery on coal continued all night. The whole place was on fire everywhere. Everywhere was burning. Going into St. Valery, you could see the traces going through the air. You had your head up a bit too high. Unfortunately, some of them passed away that way. The strikers were diving down. They were knocking the buildings a bit. We had one old soldier there, and he said, this is curtains for everybody here because we just can't get away. The 51st Highland Division, along with their French allies, were cornered and running out of ammunition. So he had no bullet in the rifle. <laughs> and no bullets in my pocket either. <laughs> we had to get all the spare ammunition. Not many anybody had been killed or wounded. The flotilla which had come to rescue the 51st was still waiting just out of range of the German guns in the English Channel. But as darkness had fallen the night before, so had a thick fog. The rescue needed to be coordinated. The vessels needed to know what each other were doing so they could go in at the appropriate time and embark troops 
in order rather than in a rush. The only way that most boats in the flotilla had to communicate with each other was using signal lamps. But of course in fog, these are almost useless and there's no way to communicate with other ships. Once you get off the coast in darkness and in thick fog, with a bunch of small vessels, all unable to communicate with each other, there was really no chance of getting many of them into San Valery. The flotilla would just have to wait again in hope that the fog would lift and the 51st could hold on for another whole day. 18-year-old Private Don Smith was now in San Valery, alone and severely injured. He'd lost a finger and suffered shrapnel wounds to his head, shoulder and back. Well, I just staggered down into St. Valerie up to the centre. We could hear the noise going on, the battle was still going on in the town. But I had to go down because they told me the hospital was there. Oh, I was dazed and tired. I didn't know what to do. It took me all the time to walk. There was civilians running around. There was nobody there to help me. Nobody stopped to, and I was just dragging myself along here. The flipping head was spinning, blood was coming out of the flipping sleeve through it, through the bandages they put on. And my they, they back felt wet where they put the plasters on my shoulder. It was all going through your mind. What the hell is, where's the Germans, you know? And I was, my eyes were peeled all over the place. People wouldn't realise just how chaotic everything was. Smoke, flashing, banging, and the state I was in, I didn't know what to do for the rest. I could hardly pull myself along. I was trying to get somewhere to rest, somewhere quiet, somewhere where I felt safe. I just didn't know what to do, or where to go for the best. I just dragging myself along. There was a chateau and I managed to get into the grounds there and there was a fountain with a, a little angel in the middle and the water coming out. This is where I just parked myself. I got down that side here. I just sat down and I thought I'd get a splash of water, freshen myself if I could with this hand. The water was a lot, it wasn't green. I wouldn't have been bothered there like, you know. And the, and the fountain was working at the time. But I couldn't, do, I couldn't even manage that. I get here and had enough and just passed out here, just sat and then nothing. Be quite honest, I don't know how long it was. I don't know whether the same day it could have been a fortnight later, you know, it was just the state I was in. And then the next thing, there was a big crash, and I think it was that thing. At the far end, being big iron gates, the German tanks came straight through. They stopped about two foot away from me. I thought the damn thing was going to run over me. Anyway, they stopped. And the next minute, these soldiers come running through told me to get up like I couldn't do anything with one of them grab me like pull me on my feet. It were rumours amongst the lads if the Germans caught any prisoners were shooting them. So I thought well I've no bloody chance. I said I'm wounded like and then the German officer I rank spoke perfect English and uh, he came across he said hold you son I said bloody hold it I'll fight you bees and he, he looked and he smiled like, he said, for you, the war is over. Not far away, the war was also ending for the rest of the 51st and their French allies. 08.15 hours, a white flag was seen to be fluttering from the steeple of a church about 100 yards from the divisional headquarters. Just 100 yards, I mean, that's no distance at all. Orders were at once issued for the flag to be hauled down and for the discovery and arrest of the person who'd hoisted it. This proved to be a French officer who told Fortune that the French had indeed capitulated. Incredibly, despite the French surrender, General Fortune resolved that the 51st would continue to fight. 
I've informed the French corps commander that my policy is I cannot, repeat, not comply with his orders until I am satisfied that there is no possibility of evacuating by boat any of my division later. You know, he's clutching at straws at this point, but what a desperate note to, to write. Eventually, though, at 10.34 a.m., after a volley of shells narrowly missed his headquarters, even Fortune was forced to admit defeat. In Saint Valery, here wurden wesentliche Teile der französischen Nordarmee eingeschlossen. General Fortune, or as some of the lad used to nickname him, Miss Fortune at that time, he had to surrender. The general, Fortune said, it would just be a mass, mass slaughter. So they decided to surrender, to save the, the lives of some of the people. Rommel himself accepted the surrender from General Fortune. I remember General Fortune, he sat on the bank and tears rolled down his face. He was broken-hearted General Fortune, who was taken a prisoner with us. But he was the one who gave the order for the 51st to surrender because there was no future for it. When news of the surrender reached the flotilla later that day, Admiral James was devastated. Writing a few days afterwards, he said, a sad and disappointed man writes to you tonight. The 51st Division one of our very best, are prisoners of war. 11,000 soldiers of the 51st were taken prisoner. They would spend the rest of the war as POWs and not return home until 1945. There were 5,000 injured and over 1,000 killed. The 51st Highland Division was practically wiped out. Their courage and sacrifice never received any official recognition, and no campaign medal has ever been awarded. They never even showed any appreciation, did they, from the war office in England for all those who were left behind. On the cliffs above San Valery on Co, there is one memorial to the bravery of the 51st. Bravery which had a profound and lasting effect on one Frenchman who fought alongside them. General Charles de Gaulle, who led the Free French, led the, the fight, the continued fight of the French. In the speech he made in Scotland in 1942, he put, for my part, I can say that the comradeship of arms between the French Armoured Division, which I had the honour to command, and the gallant 51st Scottish Division under General Fortune played its part in the decision which I made to continue the fight at the side of the Allies, to the end, come what may. There was a mate of mine, we knew each other before the army in the local area where we lived. Active laddie, full of life, funny lad at times. At times it could be the opposite, but a great friend. Great pal. We always agreed to stick together, no matter what, through thick and thin. And we did. Bless him. It is a honour to be able to come back, pay my respects, not just to Bernard, but to all the lads that were left behind in the division. None of Don's friends from the photograph he took in Scotland before the war ever made it home. Unfortunately, I'm the only one that survived and I was the one that took the photograph. That is why I always try to get to the cenotaph and remember these lads, not just them, but the rest of the lads that were with us in the 51st. It's a proud division. 
I'm so proud of the lads. I'm proud of the lads I left behind. They did a grand job. Under the circumstances, they couldn't have done better. And I still wear my badge with pride. I was proud to be with them. Proud to be one of them. I always will be. I'll never forget them.